All right, thank you, Emily. Um, I'm Dr. Nathaniel Porter. I work in the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. Uh, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, as the social science data consultant and data education coordinator, that means I help people learn about data and help people work with data. Um, so the slides, uh, would, the link will be sent afterwards, as Emily said, and there's a link to the notes. Those are open now. You can, um, you can contribute and participate uh, in real time if you want. It's like a Google Doc, so everybody can do it together. Um, afterwards, uh, eventually it will be closed down, so it's read only. Uh, I do want to introduce uh, my fellow presenters. So again, I'm Nathaniel Porter. I work in the libraries. There's my contact information. Tom? Hi, I'm Tom Ewing. I'm a, a professor of history uh, here at Virginia Tech. And I, I should add that photo is uh, timely to spring of 2020. Um, and those are actually the names of, of Virginia Tech uh, soldiers who died in World War I behind me, um, which relates to the topic I'll be discussing later on. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ann Brown. I'm an assistant professor at Virginia Tech in University Libraries with Nathaniel. I serve as the science informatics consultant to the university. I'm a biochemist by training, but I learned a lot to work with data, and I train students in how to do this through undergraduate research models. So I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about how I frame this in an undergraduate research context, and I have students from all over the university engaged in my group using data science principles to help researchers with their data. Awesome. Thank you, Tom and Ann. So uh, a little bit about our presentation uh, to help you sort of center yourself before we get going. Um, the background, we are all at Virginia Tech. Um, it is a large land grant university in Virginia, um, rural Southwest Virginia. We have a large engineering program that we're known for, uh, but we have a very wide distribution of people engaged in lots of different kinds of learning. And our motto, Uprozen, that I may serve comes up a lot. And I think you'll see some of that through here that uh, the data learning we're talking about is not just static data learning like at high school or middle school science lab. Um, it's actually working with data and sometimes actually contributing in multiple ways to um, timely research projects. Um, we do also have a strong emphasis on experiential learning and on data education at Virginia Tech. We'll talk about a little bit more, so that's a little context. Um, each of us will in turn present about one model of undergraduate learning with data. I'm going to talk about Intro to Data in Social Context, uh, which is a lower division course um, focused on thinking about the implications of data and learning through uh, learning that through hands-on approaches. Tom's going to talk about topics in data and social context, uh, which is sort of the sequel to that course and is newer and really digs into one type of data, one, one topic of data, um, and, and has done some exciting things this last year with the Spanish flu pandemic. And then Anna's going to talk about Data Bridge and other programs through the libraries um, where we actually have undergraduate and graduate uh, researchers uh, helping faculty, staff, other students at the university with exciting research projects. Uh, and then we'll have some time at the end for reflections and Q&A. We encourage you to use the Q&A or the collaborative notes throughout. So first, intro to data in social context. Um, here's the sort of motivating question of this course. It's how can you teach the ethics and societal of implications of data as well as applied data analysis, actually having people do it, to a group of 40 to 50 humanists, social scientists, engineers, undecided majors, pretty much anyone in college with no prerequisites and be successful. And this um, is a major challenge, but that's the challenge that this course has set off to take. Um, uh, we teach about five to eight sections annually at Virginia Tech now. And uh, to date, we've had over a thousand students come through this with um, really positive recognition. 
Uh, a lot of students have gone on to, um, to build on this in other ways, whether it's through the next class that Tom's gonna to talk about or other things, um, and build a passion for data and research. Um, first of all, it's a course that's listed in history, sociology and science and technology studies, but it also satisfies general university requirements, what we call pathways requirements, uh, for critical thinking in the humanities, which really appeals to the computer scientists and the engineers who want to get that out of the way, um, and the foundational quantitative and computational thinking requirement, which appeals to many social scientists and humanists who might be scared of a lot of those courses. So we get a very interesting mix of students, and it's taught either by history faculty, like Tom, uh, or grad students from any department. Usually we have a multi-day, or we've had in the past a multi-day or week summer workshop where they sort of begin to talk about the common elements of these courses and prepare their own version. What's interesting about this course um, in some ways is how it's set up. So it's focused on the social impacts, the ethics of data um, and data analytics. Um, so there's a lot of um, sort of science and technology studies, um, epistemology, talking about the philosophy of data, but also the real world implications. What happens when you start using big data to target people with advertising? What happens when um, Facebook or Twitter or Google customize their algorithms to you and people begin to see narrower and narrower things? Um, but Along with that common focus, and there's some common resources, readings, books, etc., that are frequently used by different people, each instructor makes the course their own. Um, they choose a topic, typically for the semester. So if there's three courses being taught by different people a semester, they'll all have some common core, but they will have different focal topics to illustrate. So some examples. Uh, one semester, we had a focus on the gig economy. We've talked about music streaming and taste, gerrymandering, the 2020 census, um, and even tabletop gaming. So you can see there's a wide range of topics um, that interest people. And, you know, people aren't signing up for this course knowing what that's going to be. Um, but it's a way to connect, and usually it connects to the, what that person teaching it is passionate about, too, and knows a lot about. Um, so you don't have to worry about all the words on this slide. I know I put too many on and that's not great practice, but um, the point here is that every section includes applied data analysis, but it looks completely different from time to time. I'll give you two examples in a sec. One uses qualitative coding and one uses Python. So we're at like opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, but the goal is to use some kind of real world empirical data like what you would find at ICPSR. And sometimes we have used ICPSR data, but we've really drawn on a variety of things um, to illustrate, problematize, to get people to wrestle with it in reality with some of the topics um, and challenges in the course and to use an analytic tool to do this, but the focus isn't on the tool, it's on thinking about data and learning what it's like to work with real world data. So we might use Tableau or Google Sheets or Python. Um, and in the process, we have to teach some of that, but we're really trying to emphasize thinking about the implications of the data you get in, how you process it and what you get out and interpret those findings in terms of course themes. Um, so sometimes the emphasis has been on finding data. So for example, in the gig economies one, um, they did a big project at the end about groups would choose one type of gig economy jobs. So like say um, Uber and Lyft drivers, um, they would research some articles about workers and the challenges for workers or the challenges for the systems and so on in that thing but then also find some data relevant to it that could help illustrate that and do some data visualization. Um, but we also have had focus more on data management and cleaning, like what can go wrong with your data, uh, which is often missing in a lot of undergraduate research courses. You get this really clean, perfect data that doesn't look anything like what you get if you actually do a research project. Um, choosing analytic techniques and using them. Um, and critical reflection. And that last one, critical reflection, really happens in all of them. Um, so for qualitative coding, I'm actually going to um, skip this slide and just show you an example. So um, 
over the course of a couple class sessions, um, I gave, came in, I gave a guest lecture on what is qualitative coding? How do we think about it? How is it different from, for example, a survey? Um, and then we gave them all the same article and logged them in, gave them a link to a shared Google Sheet that you can see a piece of here. There's a link in the slides to the whole thing. Um, and taught them how to make a code book. So they would read through it, note down some codes, discuss the possible codes. And then we pretty much just set them loose and said, okay, here's a sheet. Here's all the codes you guys came up with. Find quotes that fit those codes and add the codes on. And then at the end, we taught them how to use pivot tables to analyze like how frequently different codes occurred. And they could use this in their final project with different sources um, on whatever their group's topic was to, to code a few things and to see how the qualitative and the quantitative connect and to use sort of a, a formal coding to, to do this. And with the Google Sheet, we could collaboratively have 40 students doing this at the same time and had very few problems actually. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, Python, um, the course topic was music tastes and genres. So we used the million song data set or a subset of it to answer questions like, uh, are some artists louder than others? Are some genres tied more closely to one decade than others? Um, there's a variable in the data set called hotness, H-O-T-T-T-N-E-S-S-S. -S -S. No real explanation for what it is. So we got our hands dirty and the students did some digging to figure out what is it correlated with, what it's connected with, and are there reasons that we might question the value and validity of that outside of maybe as basically a reflection of how popular an artist is, which we have different variables, like how much does this actually mean? Um, and they were asked to, you know, we walked them through the steps with teaching, that link there goes to all the training materials, um, and then had them apply it in their final project, giving them some support. So here's just a snippet of some of the training materials. Um, there are lots of other data learning activities with census data, with GIS and voting data, um, um, and so on. Um, but, um, and I've helped, I don't know, probably eight, 10 courses by now, different instructors working with this. All of them have done it differently. Um, so what I found is a useful workflow, which hopefully will help you thinking about how to help with teaching. Say if you work in a library and you do data support, um, I got the instructors, they'd already done some training and sort of piloted a course proposal for how they would do it with some of their peers. Um, and then I would have them come in to meet with me typically prior to the semester and sort of work with them. Okay, what's the topic? what are the research questions and the goals you have for them in terms of learning outcomes and work with them to plan some activities that could fit in this semester and see sort of what it is that usually people come in and they're like oh i want to use in vivo or i want to use uh, stata or whatever um usually by the time we're done talking it turns out that's not actually what's most important because there's no way in a semester long lower division course for people with no research background, we can really teach them Stata or Tableau. Instead, we use those to scaffold and sort of pre-prepare some of the things to make it easier so that they can actually work with real data still and come to some conclusions and see what it's like and get a taste without having to become pros. Um, the lessons learned, um, first of all, uh, every time both the instructor and I wanted to do more than made sense. Um, you've probably found this if you've taught for any length of time, you keep sh shortening things down. Start with the learning outcomes and decide what really matters. You can't teach at this level, you can't teach everything about data analysis. Um, know your audience, streamline what you can, and then complexify when you teach so that you know, you're not artificially simplifying the data and be available. Um, this happened with a lot of partners. You can see that later. I just want to save, I want to leave more time for my colleagues and for Q&A, so I'm not going to focus on this. So with that, I'm going to mute myself and hand it over to Tom. Thank you, Nathaniel. I very much appreciate um, uh, that overview of the, of the Data and Social Context Program. 
um, as well as the, the continuing partnership uh, between academic programs and university libraries uh, here at, at Virginia Tech. Um, if you wanna go on to the, the next slide, um, there's actually kind of a lot there I'm gonna start talking about. Um, I'm gonna talk, as Nathaniel mentioned, um, about a, a course called um, Topics, in Topics in the History of Data in Social Context, um, which is a, a newer course that does build on the introduction to, to data in, in social context. And I have to add, I'm a historian, I'm a humanist. Uh, we think a lot about, about words and, and Nathaniel did not mention that um, the acronym for this uh, DISC was, was chosen quite deliberately. And I'm happy to, to talk more about that um, a little later. Um, okay, thank you. Stop, stop happening on the screen. Um, <clears throat> I'm um, each time, sorry, back up. <laughs> there you go. Um, I put these two um, images on here because they're really central to the way um, that I, I've thought about not just this course, but the, the data and social context program. Um, and it directly relates to, to my um, preparation for this presentation. Um, as you can see from the slide when it, when it reappears, um, I went to the University of Michigan uh, for my doctorate and I graduated in 1994 in, in history. Um, and so each time I see ICPSR um, on the, the data fair announcements and reminders or, or on Twitter, um, I'm reminded or I remember that I, I walked right by the ICPSR building um, in Ann Arbor. I think it's an older building. It's not the one that, that Dory has on her, uh, on her image up there. Um, it was definitely a, a building of the 1950s. And I think the only reason I walked by it was because it was on the route from my apartment to the library or to the history department, which are the, the only places I, I ever went. Um, but in thinking back on that, I also realized I, I never went in that building. I, I never went to seminars there. I did not have any faculty affiliated with that center as far as I knew. It had no relationship to my training as a historian, um, which is, I think, important um, because that was very specific to the, the context in which I was being trained um, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. The, the history was going through um, what was known at the time as the discursive turn or the linguistic turn. And there was a pretty radical move away from quantitative history um, that had re been really important in the historical profession starting in the late 1960s and especially in the 1970s and, and into the early 1980s. And so while I was in Ann Arbor, walking past the ICPSR building, um, but not going in, you know, there were these, you know, really vibrant debates about, um, you know, what kind of evidence matters, um, what kind of um, narrative are we looking for, how do we look at sources, but the influences were much more in the direction of um, interpretive uh, uh, fields. So um, anthropology, in my case, uh, literary studies, um, post-colonial theory, um, certainly, certainly feminist theory, all of those things were, were extraordinarily influential, um, not just on, on the people that were training me, but on my subsequent development as a scholar. So a couple of years ago, when I started this data and social context program, I actually had to go back and, un and, and learn things that I had not learned in graduate school. I had no training in statistics. Um, you know, and so there's been a kind of interesting um, rethinking about what I consider important in terms of, of historical analysis and historical sources. And so I put these two images up here on a very specific reason. Um, the, the photograph on the right is certainly a kind of evidence I'm very familiar with interpreting. You know, thinking about a photograph, a moment in time, who are the people, what's the story being told, what's missing, and so on. It was, you know, a, a pretty significant change for me to think about the image on the left, um, a chart, um, in this case, showing uh, deaths from influenza in the city of New York during the, the 1918 epidemic. Um, not just figure out how to make that chart, but to interpret that chart as another kind of piece of historical evidence. It's actually also a narrative. It's just, there's a story um, buried, embedded in that, in that chart. Um, there are questions about representation, about truth, um, about identity, uh, chronology, you know, which are all questions that I've been asking as a historian. I had just never really thought about them in terms of data. So when I started thinking about data in social context, it actually brought me back uh, to this interpretation. And then if you want to go on to the next image, uh, this is a, the full uh, photograph. Um, this was taken on October 16th, 1918 um, in the city of New York. There is no identifying information on the photograph, which is uh, stored as a National Archive. I've actually seen 
um, the, the, the print version, um, including the, the handwritten information on the back of the photograph at the National Archives Reading Room. Um, you can get to it um, from the, um, the National Archives um, online digital collections. If you want to go to the next slide, uh, the chart also is a historical product of this time. This comes from the monthly bulletin in the Department of Health, City of New York um, from December of 1918. And this was their attempt um, to visualize, uh, to do data analysis on the daily deaths from influenza and pneumonia in the fall of 1918. So you can see the full chart on the left. I think this is a fold out. Um, from the publication, it's the really nice scan version available online. Um, and then my blow up in the middle showing you the day by day, you know, recording of these, of these, in, of these um, deaths from these two diseases and how remarkable that moment was uh, in the fall of 1918. Going to the next slide, um, you know, so kind of putting these two things together, um, you know, both of them illustrate how important it is to think about the context um, in which these numbers are, are collected, but also to ask what they mean now um, and how we can think about them, you know, from a, from a historical perspective. And so this brings me, next slide, uh, to the spring of 2020. Um, and a course I was teaching called Topics in the History of Data and Social Context, History 2624. Um, you know, with the, the plan I made actually just about a year ago, um, in, when I started thinking about the course in October of 2019, um, was to ask this question about uh, mortality st statistics during the 1918 influenza epidemic as a problem of data and social context. How do people count um, cases and deaths? How do people respond to the epidemic as it was unfolding? Um, and what does the 1918 influenza reveal about epidemiology? And we actually were planning, to, I was planning to take the students uh, from Blacksburg on the bus um, up to Bethesda, Maryland, um, and go to the National Library of Medicine, do a presentation, meet with, with the archivists and the librarians and also uh, epidemiologists that I've um, consulted with before at NIH. And go to the next slide. Um, this comes out of a, of a historical interpretive but also epidemiological problem, which is our knowledge of deaths in 1918 is actually extraordinary, is actually quite limited in certain ways. Um, if you see any news report, you know, they're going to say approximately 650,000, 675,000 Americans died from the epidemic in, in 1918 or 1919. And that might be correct. <laughs> um, but the calculation of that death was actually done um, based on the registration states in 1918 from the U.S. Census, where, which were about 32 states, 33 counting District of Columbia. It was not the entire country. Um, and those 32 states represented about 80% of the population. But if you look at this map, the colored states show the registration states. And there are pretty significant parts of the country that are just not included in that count. And Alfred Crosby, the historian who wrote America's Forgotten Pandemic, uh, did a little bit of, of trickery here. He calculated that there were um, you know, some number of deaths from pneumonia and influenza, late 1918, early 1919, and this represented 80% of the U.S. population. And so he just extrapolated and said, well, if we, you know, include another 20% at the same rate, that's how we get 650,000, which is not very good statistics. Um, you know, it's one thing if your 80% is representative, but if your 80% is, you know, omit, omitting significant parts of the population, that's pretty, pretty speculative. And if you look at this map, you know, there are only three states, uh, four states, or, you know, <laughs> sorry, five states, um, you know, from the kind of southeast, Virginia, North Carolina, South, Car South Carolina, Tennessee, and Louisiana. But a significant part of the southeast is completely omitted. And that's where most of the African-American population is concentrated in 1918. So in terms of kind of racial representation, this, this survey is even more um, distorted. And so what I wanted students to do was actually to fill in these blind spots using other kinds of sources, but think more specifically about what it meant to have these counts, this, this sudden increase in deaths in the context of, it, the context of this epidemic. So that was the plan in January and February. Um, and then we got to spring break. Next slide, please. And things changed. Um, Virginia Tech announced halfway through spring break that all classes were going to be done remotely. Students were not going to come back. Uh, we canceled trips to the National Library of Medicine. And then when I started meeting with the students remotely, they had a different set of questions. Um, they wanted to know about media and how do you know what's reliable information in the midst of an epidemic? Um, were social distancing measures effective in 1918? Because that's what they were living with in the spring of 2020. 
how did people know when the epidemic was over? <laughs> I think we thought differently about that in March and April 2020 than we do right now. And then what lessons can we learn? So we, we reconfigured the course. Um, next slide, please. And then the other thing we did, and this was working with Dr. Jeffrey Resnick, Chief of the History of Medicine Division at the National Library of Medicine, we did a virtual um, forum. You know, instead of going to Maryland and, and presenting, we presented online, kind of like we're doing right now. Um, each of the, the students were split up into, into project teams. They worked on different parts of this topic. Um, we had some excellent commenters, uh, Nancy Bristow from the University of Puget Sound, Deborah Thomas from the Library of Congress, and David Morins, um, who was science advisor to, to Dr. Anthony Fauci at, at NI, NIAID. Um, and then we had it open for a year. I'll come back and talk about this later. Next slide. Uh, these are the 12 students um, who took part in this class. They had no idea um, when, they, when they signed up what, what we were getting into. Um, and let me just give you a couple examples of the kinds of things they looked at. Next slide. Um, they compared front page reporting um, with the keyword either influenza and epidemic. Um, in some regional newspapers. They'd use these newspapers to do other kinds of case studies. But, you know, as you can see, most of the newspapers reported a lot about this epidemic as it was happening. In fact, um, in, in four of those newspapers, either of those keywords appeared on every single front page um, during October. Others reported less. Um, you know, in most cases, the front pages were dominated by the war. Um, in October 1918, and the influenza and epidemic news was in the back pages. But there's, you know, clear empirical evidence here that Americans who were reading newspapers in 1918 knew about the, had access to information about this epidemic. Uh, next slide. Um, we compared um, cases um, in two states, Indiana and Missouri, where we had good um, kind of granular data from the state health reports. Uh, next slide. Um, that let us compare um, uh, uh, death rates in Indiana by county, um, comparing both the rates and the total number to the population. Um, and what we actually found were higher death rates in some more sparsely populated areas, which is kind of goes counter to what we usually think. We think of the cities in 1918 as being, you know, having poor health and higher death rates. Uh, next slide. Um, similarly, when we looked in Missouri, um, we found a similar kind of pattern. Obviously, some of the larger cities, Kansas City and St. Joseph City, St. Louis, you know, had pretty high death rates, but then some pretty, again, sparsely populated counties. Um, we have not gone back, it's probably my fault, uh, to look more closely at why this was, but this was the kind of thing that the students, you know, had direct access to because they had, could look at this data, but they were also thinking about the data in context. You know, where does it come from? Why does it matter? How did it matter to people at the time? And how does it matter um, subsequently? Next slide. So this is a screenshot of the, the presentation um, that we did at the end of April, 2020. Um, it's, it was recorded. Um, we had 500 people watching it live, um, and then 800, you know, have watched it since then. So, so you know, 1,200, whatever, uh, 1,400, excuse me, you know, watching this presentation, which is easily 50 times the number we would have had if we'd actually followed the, the original plan of going to, to the NIH campus and, and doing this presentation to a, a smaller invited group. Um, final slide. A um, couple of things here. Um, the, the, the symposium got nice coverage. The NIH record wrote a good article about what the students learned. Virginia Tech News has also um, done similarly, similar kinds of things. So I learned an awful lot, you know, from, from this session, um, you know, just in terms of, of how to, as Nathaniel suggested earlier, how to think about data, um, how to put data in the context, you know, um, some of the skills that the students learned in terms of um, understanding the data and visualizing it, presenting it, talking about it. Um, obviously, studying an epidemic in the midst of an epidemic is a um, very, very difficult um, thing. Um, it was, I think, it was emotionally hard on me. Um, I think it was also hard on the students, particularly given everything else that was going on in their lives um, at the time. Um, you know, but, but I learned a lot from it. I, I put two quotes on here. These were from the student evaluations of instruction in the spring of 2020. Um, the first comment, certainly appreciating the opportunity to present um, at the NIH. Uh, the second comment, um, you know, in terms of the timing, that this was something that was immediately relevant to their lives. Um, I highlighted the second um, because I, I really appreciate student, evalu student evaluations where they recognize that I am um, you know, making up this course as I go. Um, the student, you know, put a nice positive spin on that, that I was a collaborator participating in it. Um, but I appreciate, you know, that the, the, the student and the others saw the uniqueness of this experience, not just the timing, but the, also the chance to think critically 
um, about what data means in, in a particular context. So I'll stop there and happy to, to address any questions when we come back to that after, after Dr. Brown's talk. Thanks for that, Nathaniel and, and Tom. It's exciting to kind of see how we can engage data in multiple ways. And I have one little piece to talk about how we engage with the COVID-19 pandemic as well in my program called Data Bridge. Uh, I run a very large undergraduate research program that's kind of broken into two halves. Half does mostly data science for a variety of projects on campus. The other half does molecular modeling. So we have a very interdisciplinary group. And so for the half that does data science, we really have these students acting as consultants for different projects and, and uh, things going on at the university. And that is the Data Bridge program. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that. And so myself and Nathaniel both work in university libraries as part of data services. And in this, we have developed a robust ability to do consult consults across the university and form partnerships. Uh, one of the questions in the Q&A for during Nathaniel's talk was about how many full-time faculty staff do we have. In data services, I believe we have nine to ten full-time faculty uh, in different domains. I'll highlight those in a second. But one of the things, as our group is very new, I believe we're kind of four to five years old as an actual department in university libraries, we started to really understand what researchers need. And that's the fact that they need more data and they already have a lot of data and they need help with this. And so they need help with the data in all stages of the research life cycle, creating, maintaining, managing, analyzing, and sharing it. There is an overwhelming burden upon some of people in different domains where there is continually a new tool coming out, new versioning of software, software breaking because of different kinds of dependencies and kind of being in di different disciplines, it's a lot to handle sometimes. And so our group really seeks to kind of help individuals across the university with this and their research and teaching by providing our services. And so we're really looking to enhance research impact for success in publishing and grant funding. And so data and informatics services at BT, we kind of operate on a three different kind of model system where we can collaborate with individuals we can offer kind of one-off consultations or we can be full-on partners where we're actually co-PIs on different grant applications. We can kind of take the approach of doing a T-shape of our services where we're having breadth and depth. And we have that breadth and depth because in our group, we have individuals that are from their actual domains like self science and health, which is where I come from, uh, Nathaniel's and the social scientists. And then we also have experts in our group in visualization and engineering as well. And so with this kind of combined expertise, we can really offer a robust, robust set of services to Virginia Tech, as well as being kind of data, data gurus ourselves. And so as we started to offer our consultations and, and kind of get ourselves known to the VT campus and beyond, we started to really realize, and we published a paper on this in uh, the PERC um, proceedings in 2018, that there was really a bigger call for collaboration and partnership level services from us, where we were becoming kind of the data, data kind of experts on the project to really help the project go from start to finish. And the more we were able to engage with individuals from the start, the better the outcomes and the better the integrity of the data that could be published then and, and actually housed long term. So um, there's only so many of us and we needed more hands to do this. We needed more human power because we can only consult and be partners on so many projects and actually write code and learn different programs and become kind of some experts in these different areas of which we're all in. And so to do that, one of the things that I've kind of take as one of my own personal in research interests is how can we better prepare students for the workforce by using experiential learning uh, experiences like undergraduate research. And so undergraduate research is a big thing of something that I do and I'm very interested in and interested in understanding the pedagogy behind but I also saw it as an excellent way to gain more human power to be able to participate in these deep level on consults across the university. And so this kind of became kind of a twofold win-win in that we had more human power to work on these projects and do some of the more you know, in-depth kind of groundwork on these projects. But also we were starting to create a community of students that could be data champions. They would understand the need for different kinds of data integrity, data management, file naming schemas, how to actually set up and plan your data collection from the beginning rather than after you've collected the data and realize there's going to be a lot of data cleaning that needs to happen. And so in order to kind of make this a comprehensive program and kind of bring the pedagogical aspects into this, we needed to create a teaching structure and a curriculum, especially to see how we can promote inclusivity because we didn't want this to be 
closed off to any majors. We wanted students who wanted to learn about data science and how to work with data across the research life cycle to be able to join the program and work as a consultant in our group, uh, and but also kind of be able to get some of the work done as well. We needed to train students and we needed projects. And luckily the last one with projects was not hard to find given the needs of data, data support across the university. And so that's where DataBridge was born. We're in our second year of, of getting everything started. We have 15 students right now, and we have this as a consult-based environment. The entire undergrad research program is housed at a university libraries. We have students that are building scripts. We have students that are working with Tableau and parsing survey data to make interactive visualizations. We have a curriculum in place where students that do join, their first semester is spent training in basic data science techniques, how to ask a question, how to find data, and then they complete a micro research project as part of that first semester of training. Uh, we have all students do that, even if they're proficient in Python and R or any other kind of our JavaScript, for example, because we want everyone to feel like they're on the same playing field and we want to make sure they they really have the foundation. They're not just kind of pieced together pieces of information. Uh, the other piece I want to highly mention is that student success is a top priority. So we always want to make sure that we're supporting our students in in doing these endeavors because it's often on top of a, a rigorous course load as well. So making sure that we're mentoring our students and seeing that they have these applications of what they're doing that can benefit them in the workplace and that they're highlighting the skills they've learned, such as learning how to work remotely during the past year. So I want to kind of go over a little bit of the framework and details of how we set the program up and how and what our students learn as a part of my program for Data Bridge. Uh, this is right here. Uh, this is a pre-COVID-19 photo of us in the data visualization studio where we typically met for our small group meetings and lab meetings. Uh, we have some great resources there that have some big screens and monitors where we can all sit around and do different kind of aspects with data viz. Um, so what does this look like? What does data bridge look like? How's our model look and how would a student be entering this? And then I'd also like to add a variety of these resources are already openly available through different kinds of library resources we have at Virginia Tech, like the Odyssey uh, repository. And I'm also happy to share things as well. Everything that I have is currently set up as modules on Canvas, which I believe I can share kind of easily um, if, if you have access to Canvas. Um, and so we have all students that kind of that join data bridge start with a training and research methodology, how to use data ethically, how to organize data. Uh, one of the most popular topics is how to name files and version control. Uh, that's very important, very popular. We have a reflection question that goes into uh, Do they have you ever overwritten a file. And then we really start digging into the data science background here uh, with different kinds of how to ask a question, how to use Excel, how to use pivot tables, how to use VBA going into good data visualization, and then based on student interests and aptitude, we let them go either into more visualization or data engineering outcomes. And then kind of as a collective whole, we have students participating in a variety of undergraduate research symposiums, consulting on projects across Virginia Tech. I'm gonna highlight just a few of those quickly in the next couple slides, but really also we have students walking out of our program with durable skills and data science that they can then take back to their discipline domains as well. And those are kind of where research literacy and data literacy come into our program. This is just kind of a, a, put, a thing we put together for what our students look like. So they act as consultants, but they're also problem solvers, analysts, visual, visualizers, stewards, hopefully giving both their fellow student colleagues and people that we're working off with on our consults better kind of concepts of how to put their data together in the big picture going from determining what the problem is when the consult comes in the door to actually being able to deploy solutions and have long-term outcomes. It's just some basic tools that we go over here in a kind of more organized way, but we do data cleaning through a variety of means. We typically do use Python here, but we also then have data analysts where we do have students learning some of the more industry standards like Tableau, R, uh, and Excel. Everything has its place. We actually have things where we talk to students about it, when is it okay to use, like Excel is still great and fine to use, knowing when and what tool to use is a big part of our program as well. And then we have our own Git and AWS suites is where we have things that are hosted. We do open, uh, emphasize open access. Uh, we have an open science framework page where we put a lot of our scripts and data that we have for different papers that we publish. And we also put our data on the VTEC data repository. So students are learning about these kinds of concepts now uh, for whenever they go into their next stage of their careers. 
some quick use cases to highlight for you all. We've done a variety of things like collaboration maps and different kinds of data cleaning, which is that figure in the top there of how we've had to uh, use Tableau Prep to manipulate some data to actually get it to be workable. We've done this with the Chicago Elections Project, with his, which is in partnership with Dale Windling. Uh, and we've looked at doing this with GIS renderings and taking data from his electoral um, information there as well. If you can go to the next slide. Uh, and so we can have some really cool um, data here where we've taken that historical data that they've got digitized and put it into meaningful pieces of information. And hopefully soon we'll have a working database that anyone can access with this information. We've also done this for the uh, antimicrobial resistance project. This came in as a consult to us where they wanted to mine the literature on how language of antimicrobial resistance has changed um, from 2000 to 2019. And we actually were able to utilize and create scripts where we could parse these PDFs and look at trends in language over time. And then finally to add, add in with COVID-19 is this happened and a great thing that Tom mentioned, since we were kind of living it, students wanted to participate and learn a little bit more since my group is unique in that we do have sciences and data sciences in my, in my field. We were able to make some really creative models to visualize the biological aspects of COVID-19. And we had students working to make interactive maps of how the, it was spreading across the United States. So it was really great to see that combination with the, the biological sciences and the data sciences. Where are we at so far? So we've had over 35 active students. We've increased confidence in critical thinking and we have over 30 collaborations and partnerships. I've only just highlighted a couple of the ones that we're working on. So it's very cool to be able to see students work on all these projects uh, kind of as individual teams and then as a collective group, they learn more about them. We're a highly collaborative group, so I'm happy to share materials and syllabi and things like that with how I set undergraduate research up and how I can get all these students moving in one direction. We also do have some wage students as well and how that works, I'm happy to talk about. But then I think we can kind of wrap all this up into some conclusions and we can answer some Q&A. All right, thanks, Anne. So just some high level summary things to maybe get the Q&A started while uh, people have a chance to put some more questions into the Q&A that they would like to see addressed in the few minutes we have left. Um, teaching with data when you're not talking about a data or methods course, but uh, these various other ways that integrate it works best when the data and the activities are uh, relevant, they, they, they matter now, uh, that came up multiple times here. They're integrated into the other pieces. It's not like, okay, now we've got our data time and now we've got our talking time and there the two shall meet. Um, and they're really focused on what you really want the students to take away. Um, and using real world data, not this perfectly clean, sort of like the machine learning iris data set example of uh, everything is already ready to go, not like you'd see in the real world. And it relies on this scaffolding and building where you can lay the foundation for the principles of data, build it up by practicing, and then interpret together and work with people. So I'm gonna put this slide up and leave it up, and Tom and Ann and I are all available to ask, answer questions. Um, Ann, I'm gonna have you go first uh, because we had a question coming in during yours on how many people in the library support DataBridge and how the program takes, or yeah. how long the program takes. Sure, um, so right now for DataBridge, I am the, the principal investigator of it and we have one faculty who is the manager of it as well. So two effectively. Um, and then we have the program set up so that you could join as a first semester freshman and do the training. And then you can participate in the program un until you graduate effectively. We're able to offer undergraduate research credits through a few different departments at Virginia Tech that I have affiliate status with. Uh, and then we do have uh, four wage positions that we can offer each year. And we have that kind of on a rolling basis. And it does also depend if we get additional grants, if we can hire more students in that capacity. But it is set up that students could participate in the program from freshman to senior year. Awesome. Um, so question for any of us, how do you keep students engaged who are struggling with the technological aspects of programming like coding? Tom says he wants to answer it. All right, go for it, Tom. I'm clicking a button and didn't know what would happen. I mean, I think one of the, <clears throat> one of the values in the introduction data social context program is the students come from a lot of different majors. 
Um, and certainly when I've taught the course, I've done as students work collaboratively and often they balance this out. You know, the students who come from computer science or computational modeling and data analytics, you know, are, are, are in there with an English major or major in communication and they can, you know, they kind of draw on their different skills. So we really tried to set that up. And then as Nathaniel said earlier, keep expectations low. You know, don't, don't think you're going to train, train students through a high level skill over the course of the semester, really focus it. Um, on what they need. So Professor Winling with the, with the elections project um, and some other things that really focused on some basic kind of GIS coding. Uh, but then once they get that, they do, you know, amazing things over the course of the semester. So that would be my suggestion. Thanks. Um, we had a question. Uh, uh, do we find current undergrads are more, are more interested in learning data science methods applied to fields or just learning the methods regardless of the theme? And I'll start, but the others of you might jump in if we have any time left to say that um, I hear people talk about wanting to learn data science-y things like Python or R or whatever, but um, I find that students have a really hard time engaging if they don't connect it to something. Just taking a class where you learn to do, go through the procedures and motions of a coding language or something doesn't stick the same as applying it to some context. And that's why I think data and social context and data bridge have both been successful. Yeah, I can also couple that. Um, I think we, we've really framed things in our group as there's a problem to solve and then let's think about how we can collectively solve it together. And then we have people that might have some of the more domain background kind of chime in with that. Um, but when they really see it as a collaborative effort, they, they start taking the things they're learning in data science and then applying it back to their domains, which is a great way to frame it so it's not as intimidating for some students that say I'm not in this in this domain and field, it really gives them more empowerment to move forward with learning these techniques and skills is what I found. And I'm sorry to interrupt this incredible conversation, but we do have to wrap up this presentation um, in order to make way for the next presentation coming up. Thank you so much to all three of our presenters. This was fantastic. Um, Dory has posted our help email in the chat. So if there was a question that you didn't have time to send in or wasn't answered live, you're welcome to send that in and we will follow up with anybody who does send in those questions. Thank you again so much. This was a tremendous presentation. I have personally learned many things I can use in my own teaching. So I wanna say thank you so much to our three presenters and thank you all to everyone who was in attendance today. I look forward to seeing you at the next Data Fair presentation. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, bye.